Next, we're going to talk about an important instance of an equivalence relation in computer science and especially cryptography is something called modular arithmetic. Uh, so before we get into the relation, we're going to have to remind ourselves of a couple of properties of the integers. This is called the division algorithm, and it says let a be any integer and let n be a non-zero integer. There exist unique integers q and r, where r is between 0 and n minus 1, and a can be written as q times n plus r. In this case, n is called the modulus, and we write r is equal to a mod n. And this is just the theorem that tells us that long division works. So, for example, 25 mod 7 would be equal to 4 because we can write 25 as 3 times 7 plus 4. So in this case, uh, 7 is the modulus, that's n. The quotient q is 3, and the remainder r is 4. We can also do this with negative numbers. Negative 19 mod 4 is equal to 1 because we can write we can write negative 19 as equal to negative 5 times 4 plus 1. Now one of the ways you might try to have done this if you paused the video and tried it yourself before I answered is that you can write negative 19 as negative 4 times 4 plus negative 3. So you might have been tempted to say that the remainder was negative 3. Um, but that's not right, because if you come up here and look, you see that the remainder has to be between 0 and n minus 1. So it has to be a positive number, or a non-negative number at least. Um, so negative 3 would not be the remainder. Um, so you, if you kind of do it positive, you might think, okay, well, 19 mod 4, you'd have 16, uh, you'd have 3 left over. So you'd think that maybe negative 3 is the answer. So I call that the naive answer because it's almost right, but not quite. Um, so you can take your naive answer. So let's say here's 0. Here's negative 19. And you have kind of the right idea that you can take off 4 negative 4s and get yourself to negative 3. And you know that's not the right answer because negative 3 is negative. So then you can add the modulus one more time. to take you to the correct modulus, which is 1. Or sorry, to take you to the correct remainder, which is 1. Um, so that's a way that you can get from the wrong answer that you might have been um, primed to come up with to a correct answer. Uh, let's try that one more time. We have negative 31 mod 6 is going to be equal to 5, because negative 31 can be written as negative 6 times 6 plus 5. Again, if you tried to take away negative 30, you'd get negative 1 as your answer. And since you know that the answer can't be negative 1, you just add 6, and that gives you 5. All right, so that's the idea of this equivalence relation we're going to develop. So we're going to let a and b be any integers and let n be a non-zero integer. We say that a and b are equivalent modulo n or congruent modulo n if a mod n is equal to b mod n. And in that case, we write that a and b are equivalent mod n. This is the relation. And in fact, it's an equivalence relation. And one of your homeworks will be to prove that, that it has the properties of reflexiveness, symmetry, and transitivity. Um, so let's see some examples of this as an equivalence relation. 22 is equal to 2 mod 4, because you can uh, pull off um, 5 4s or 20 and have 2 left over. Uh, 18 is also equal to 2 mod 4, because you can pull away the 16. Yet 9 is only equal to 1 mod 4. So 22 and 18 are congruent or equivalent mod 4. 
but 22 is not equivalent to 9. So in the relation, we'd have 22 and 18 related to each other, but 22 and 9 not related to each other. Uh, that means we can talk about equivalence classes. So we're going to write down the equivalence classes mod 4. Just doing mod 4 as an example. And the idea is that there's going to be one equivalence class for each possible remainder. So think about it. If I divide a number by 4, my only possible remainders are 0, 1, 2, and 3. Well, since every uh, equivalence relation is reflexive, 0 is going to be related to itself. So is 1, so is 2, so is 3. And so I'm just going to list some numbers that are equivalent to 0, 1, 2, and 3 mod 4. So what are the numbers where if I divide by 4, I get a remainder of 0? Well, obviously 4 is 1, and so is 8, so is 12. And we can kind of start to see the pattern in that direction. We've also got to think about negative integers like negative 4, negative 8, and negative 12. And what we notice is that if two integers are related modulo 4, then their difference is going to be a multiple of 4. So that's why we get uh, all the this this that's why we get this pattern where we add 4 over and over again to make our equivalence class. Um, so it stands to reason that if I add 1 to 4, I get 5, which is equivalent to 1 mod 4. If I divide 5 by 4, I get a remainder of 1. Same with 9, same with 13. And then going the other way, I subtract 4 to get negative 3, negative 7, negative 11, etc. in that direction. If I divide 2 by 4, I get a remainder of 2, same with 6. Same with 10, and same with 14. Same with negative 2, same with negative 6, same with negative 10. And then finally, the equivalence class of 3 mod 4 is 3, 7, 11, 15. In the other direction, we have negative 1, negative 5, negative 9, etc. And it's interesting to point out here that the equivalence classes mod 4 totally partition the integers into four different sets. Even though there's an infinite number of integers, under equivalence mod 4, there's really only four different integers, 0, 1, 2, and 3. Every other integer is related to one of these four. All right. So one last thing we want to touch on before we stop talking about modular arithmetic is kind of the nice algebraic properties of the modulus function. So when we write it this way, without that equivalence, um, we're doing a function. Now, of course, the relation is based on the function and vice versa, so we can really pass between them. But the way I wrote this, this is a function. So if I have a plus b and then I take its remainder modulo n, I get the same thing as if I did the remainders of a and b first, added those together, and then took the remainder of the result. Um, same thing with multiplication. I can do the product first and then take the remainder, or I can take the remainders first and then multiply those together. And so this is really nice because we get to chop our big numbers down into smaller numbers. So let's see a couple of examples. If I have 17 plus 59 mod 10, then I can just take the remainders of the add-ins. So 17 mod 10 is 7. 59 mod 10 is 9. I've got to keep my mod 10 on there, and you'll see why right now, because when I add 7 and 9 together, I'm going to get 16, which is not a remainder mod 10. So 16 mod 10 is actually 6. So that's why you notice we have that remainder being taken one last time in both of these, because after addition and multiplication, your number might be too big to be a remainder. And since 17 and 59 are actually pretty small numbers, we can check our work. So 17 plus 59 uh, is equal to 76. 76 mod 10 is sure enough 6. Uh, let's try it with multiplication now. We've got 51 times 93 mod 4. Uh, so let's see, 51, I can pull away a 48, and I'm left with 3. 
Uh, 93 is uh, pretty close to 80, so that would leave me with 13. Then I can subtract 12, and then I'm just left with 1. So that's 3 times 1 mod 4, which is just 3. All right, let's uh, see one more example. We've got 17 to the 6th power minus 42 times 106 mod 3. And this one looks a little scary until you remember two things. Uh, first of all, exponentiation is just repeated multiplication. So I could rewrite this as 17 mod 3 to the 6th power minus 42 mod 3 times 106 mod 3 mod 3 because remember my number might be too big and I might have to mod it by 3 again. Alright, well 17 mod 3 is just 2. 42 mod 3 is equal to 0, because 42 is itself 3 times 14. So that means it doesn't matter what 106 mod 3 is, because I'm going to be multiplying it by 0. So who cares? Uh, 2 to the 6 is equal to 64 mod 3. 64 is way too big to be a remainder mod 3, uh, so we subtract 63 and get 1 as our result.